Well, good morning. I'm going to try not to breathe while I speak. Just seeing if you're awake. So what we do, this is a tradition here um, of remembering the Lord Jesus Christ, and we do this every week. And it's been a tradition of brethren assemblies throughout North America and around the world. So if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, by all means, please take part. And first of all, what we'll do is we'll pass the cup around. And as the elders have pointed out, it's gluten-free bread. Just for those of you who don't want any of that stuff. So, and then we'll pass out the cup as well. And I've asked Alan if he would play again. Um, he played the last time I had the opportunity to do this. And there's something about music, right? I think we all agree with that. Um, music touches our soul. It seems to awake emotions. And it's not designed to be an emotional time. It's designed to be a focus time on someone other than yourself. There is a book that's written that says, and the first line in the book is this, it's not about you. Which is in contrary, it's contrary to the society we live in because everything's about you. But we get the chance and the opportunity to come together this morning and to remember the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us. It's a powerful, powerful thing. I wonder, Gail, and of course, I um, didn't tell you this, but there is a, can you, can you put a PowerPoint back up? The last one that we sang, And the reason I do that is because sometimes when we focus, we focus on the words other than ourself. Um, yeah, there it is. So it says this, you can see it, is it up there? Jesus, Lord, over all. You ready? Be the Lord over who? Me. We come humbly today and we say, be the Lord over me. Jesus, drawn to this altar, I come. Here is my heart. May your will be done in me. So when you say those words, are you thinking about yourself? Or are you thinking about something that was done for you? The beauty of this is the Lord Jesus Christ with God the Father and God the Son decided in ages past that Jesus would become the Lamb of the world that was slain before the foundation. We know that God doesn't dwell in time. He dwells outside of time. And therefore, the sacrifice of Christ is really, when you go through the Old Testament, you see it played over again and again and again, that there was a greater cause that people could put their trust in. And what did it say about Abraham? Abraham believed and was credited to him as righteousness. So today, we know the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, so we can come humbly and we can remember what he's done on the night before his crucifixion. He was with his disciples in the upper room. And he said, this is my body broken for you. In Psalm 22, right, written how many years before Jesus came? Hundreds. It was said that if one prophecy could come true, if just one, from the Old Testament and the New Testament, it would be like throwing or filling Alberta with quarters three feet high, putting an X on one, throwing it out of a plane, and trying to find it. Just one prophecy. There's close to 200 about Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection. So we come here, yes, it's emotion, but we come here based on fact. 
Is there an amen in your heart? We come here in fact, and we can focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first thing he did was he said, this is my body broken for you. And as long as you do this, you proclaim my death until I return. I thank uh, Jared for praying about Israel. They have endured so much, so much. But who came out of Israel? Jesus. And we're going to talk a little bit today how us in the message, how we who were so far away were brought in and we were grafted in. And now there's no difference between a Jew or a Gentile for we're all one in Christ. So would you join me this morning? I'll ask the servers to come forward. We'll, we'll pray for the bread. It'll be passed around and then once that's done, we'll give thanks for the wine as well, which is juice. And then at the end, we'll pass around these little plates. And this is for the offering. I'm kidding. This is for you to put your cups back in. Okay. So, Father, we just we thank you this morning for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his broken body for us. I'm reminded in Psalm 22 that it says, not a bone of him was broken. And when the soldiers came <clears throat> to see if he had passed away, he had already passed away because their intention was to break the legs so that they would suffocate those on the cross. But he was already dead because what did he say? Father, I commend my spirit to you. He gave it up. Jesus willingly gave up his life so that we could have life. And that is a somber but beautiful thing. So fill our hearts with joy. Fill our hearts with your vision as we take of this bread this morning. And just fill us with who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And we give you thanks in his name. Amen. my blood shed for you. And well, you know, in the book of Hebrews, it said, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Without the sprinkling of blood on the altar, there's no forgiveness. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus died, see, I can picture this. When Jesus died, the cloth that separated the priests from the Holy of Holies in the temple did what? It was torn in two from the top to the bottom. 
who made the way? Jesus made the way. For he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. That's who we worship today. We worship the one who made a way through his blood and gave us freedom to walk in that truth. So let's give thanks. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who willingly, but not without pain, gave himself for us. We think of his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible tells us he prayed drops of blood because it was such a, he knew what he was doing. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what it would cost him. And we'll never understand, Father, how you turned your back on your son. And Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? And at that moment, he took all our sin and it was poured on him. And he did it gladly. He did it willingly. And this morning, we come in that spirit and that intent of understanding that Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had, sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. We're free in Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're um, just as a reminder for those who are visiting and people who've been away a little bit. First Sunday on the Colossians, Book of Colossians, Fred talked about what would we like to get a letter. What would we like to send a letter to maybe a new fellowship that started here in Red Deer? What would we say and how would we encourage them? And what would we do to kind of lift them up? And then Uncle Al came back and that's me. And then I talked about what it is that Paul was praying for. What was he praying for the believers? What did he want to see for the believers? What type of things was he hoping would make um, them mature in Christ, or grow in Christ? And then last week, or that was Thanksgiving, but the weekend before, Jared came and talked about the preeminence of Jesus. And pretty powerful message. Because anytime you can talk about who Jesus really is, right, it 
actually takes the focus off of you and lifts it onto him. And then you go, oh my goodness, I'm a man of unclean lips. Right? I'm a man of unclean lips. Because when you really see him for who he is, there is a, something that happens within your heart. And then, this morning, we're looking at Colossians 1, 24 uh, to 2, chapter 5. So I'm going to read that, but before I do that, I was thinking about the one song they sang, about the Lord is over all. And then the book of Philippians, verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 9, says this, God has given Jesus a name that is above every name. And we don't know what that is, but that's how highly favored he is. That's how highly he favored he is within the Trinity. He served a purpose. He's given a name above every name. And that's the Jesus that we serve. So good. Turn to Colossians 1, 24 to 2, verse 5. And I'm reading from the New International Version. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, which is the church, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may, we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are and how you're firm your faith in Christ is. Well, it's interesting. I, I spoke briefly about Gnosticism and Jewish beliefs and just touched on it briefly. You can look more into it, but it's really interesting. One of the things about Gnosticism is that people have, they tend to say, I have a kind of a secret knowledge, and it's only given to a few of us. And if you're ever anywhere, or a church anywhere, where someone says, I, God has revealed to me all the secrets, and then you just need to learn from me, and don't go anywhere else, and don't read, and don't learn, uh, what I would advise you to do is before the sermon's done, run out the door screaming, maybe get your hair on fire, because it's crazy for anyone to do that. Right? Anyone. But what Paul is trying to straighten out here and make very clear is um, I want you to know that the mystery, any mystery that's revealed in the New Testament was hidden in the Old Testament because something different happened. We know in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit came on people for a time and then left. But in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, what happened after Jesus Christ died on the cross and then ascended back to heaven, he said, before that, he said, I will send the helper. Now remember, the Jews used to go to the temple. But what happened was this was fused together, brought together, and now there was no need to go to the temple because who became the temple? Individual Christians became the temple, and the temple wielded together, put together in a very mysterious way, is called the church. And it is so interesting, you can go anywhere in the world, the people who know Jesus Christ as their Savior, and you can have fellowship, and you can have beautiful times of refreshment, and go, what is the deal? 
one time in Pakistan. I was asked to speak to this group. They sent out the young guy. They said, you go check this group because they actually want to use this retreat center and we're not sure what they believe. And I said, okay, because back then I knew everything, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so I went. <laughs> And I was checking to see what they believed and about the atonement. And yes, they believed in the atonement. And we went through and we agreed on so many things. And then I said, why can't you and I have fellowship together? And they didn't answer the question, wouldn't answer the question, because I was not of the right faith. So I said to them, I don't think you can be here. Because what I've noticed in the world is anyone who knows the Lord Jesus Christ, they might be charismatic, they might be really fundamental, but the thing that draws us together is that we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and that he changed our life and that's what we put our focus on. Amen? That's where we put our focus. And there's fellowship. We can talk about things. It's great. And here's one for you. The message today is supposed to be about Christian maturity. So this is free. You don't have to pay for this. But one of the signs of Christian maturity and maturity is you stop talking about people and you start talking about ideas. Did you hear me? Isn't it amazing how we can talk about people without even thinking about it and pretty much drag them to the ground, kick them to the curb, and think we've done nothing wrong? And yet, we don't see Jesus doing that. I mean, didn't the disciples say, shouldn't we go and cause fire to come down on those people because they're bad people? And Jesus said, leave them alone. Leave them alone. Because he was more concerned about the cause of what he had to do to complete his mission for God the Father. So, it says in verse 24, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. So, Paul is giving a hint here that the mystery now is in his church. Prior to this, the church, the bride of Christ, did not exist. It did not exist. Now, there were believers, obviously, in the Old Testament, but you can't call it the church of Christ. Can I get an amen from the theologians in the crowd, right? That's not there. But when Jesus died on the cross and he, he was resurrected, and the most beautiful thing is, is that when he was called back to heaven, he said, I am sending a helper. I am sending you a helper. Now, no longer did they have to go and worship in the temple. In fact, what did Jesus say to the Samaritan lady? If you knew who was asking you for water, you would ask for the living water, and I would give it to you. And then she said, our people serve on the mountain, or worship on this mountain, or we can't get to Jerusalem to worship me. He says, I tell you, anyone who worships me will worship me in, can you finish it, spirit and in truth. And that's what Paul's speaking of. He says, don't be fooled by somebody else coming in and trying to trick you. This mystery, it says, this mystery has been kept hidden for ages, and I'm in verse 26 now, and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Deb and I were talking about this. What's the hope of glory? What's that mean for you? Well, they're words. They, they certainly are words. But what does it mean? Like, what does it mean in your daily life? What does it mean in your daily living? Like, what does it mean practically? The hope and glory. You know, sometimes we Christians can do a lot of, we call it Christian speak. You know, I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. And if you're talking to someone who doesn't know Jesus, they're going, pardon? <laughs> Which lamb? And what do you mean washed in the blood? I don't think that's a good way to get clean. And so the thought process is different. So, but what happens is the Holy Spirit keeps 
telling us more and more about who Jesus Christ is, and that's where we grow into maturity, into Jesus. But I want to just share a little verse for you. You can look at this if you want, a little bit of Bible gymnastics. It's Ephesians 2, 12, and 13. Because understand that we have come, we have come from somewhere being brought into a relationship with, with God through the Lord Jesus Christ and his completed work. So in Ephesians 2, verse 12, all right, it says this. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizens, citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Whew. See, that, that's an amen. That's an exciting thing because the thing is we were kept outside of that, but he's actually brought us into that relationship and he's actually formed us as one body, the church of Jesus Christ. But we were alienated, we were separated, and even in Colossians earlier on, it says we have been transformed, we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. That is exciting. The kingdom of darkness, I wonder what that looks like. I wonder if that's people going and killing innocent children randomly. I wonder if that's the abuse that happens around the world. I wonder if that's the things that go on in homes that are unspeakable. I wonder if that's the kingdom of darkness, because that's not the kingdom of light. That's not the kingdom of light. We get translated into the kingdom of light, and we start to live like Jesus. And that's the point of this message, is we want to be mature like Jesus. So I said something. This is free. And Gail, if you don't mind, you can put up that, that illustration. So I talked about this when I spoke a few weeks ago. But I had to tell you something. If the only time you hear the word of God is by listening to a sermon, the Word of God will never dwell richly within you. It will always be outside, and it will be strangely cold. And the stuff about Jesus will be strangely boring. It won't be encouraging at all. Because as once you walk up these doors, and as, as, as an ex-principal, I know, educationally speaking, you'll remember less than 10% of what I've said. But, can you, can you see it? Is it clear enough? If you can hear it, that's good. That's found in Romans. And you can write these down if you want. You can take a picture of this if you want. I don't own this. Okay? I didn't make this up. In fact, nothing I do is I made up. I borrow a lot of things. Hearing, reading, study, memorizing, meditation, and then application. When I do this at a Bible camp with kids, I always pick the biggest kid or the biggest counselor. And I say, come on up here. So they come up and they don't know what's going on, but they're game to do something because they like the attention. So I bring the big guy up and I'll say, okay, just hearing the word of God, how's that for a base? And they go, not very good. Okay, well, how about, you know, how about uh, reading it? Okay, well, it's a little bit better. Uh -huh. And I'm always pulling the Bible away from them. And they're going, they're kind of, you can you look at their face and they're just kind of incredulous because they know that they don't want me to take it but I keep doing it. And then I get their hand bigger, right? They read it, they study it, they memorize it. And the big one is the thumb. Because once the thumb starts happening and you meditate on it, Watchman Nee, some of you have heard of Watchman Nee, Watchman Nee studied Galatians 2.20 for a year. A year to try and fully understand what it means. And what that verse is, is I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by the power, right, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he studied that for a year. What's wrong with him? But I'll tell you what, I get the biggest, strongest kid, and these aren't water wings either, so I can hang on to the Bible. So they come up, and they're trying to take the Bible from me. <laughs> No, it's mine. It belongs to me. It's mine. And that means that the application of the Word of God is how I mature in Christ. 
It's interesting. You can have 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years of one year's experience and never mature in Jesus Christ. I'm not sure that's the intent here. Paul says, I am wanting and I desire and I'm admonishing, in verse 28, and I am teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Whenever you saw Paul, I guess he's talking about this. He's talking about this. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about that. He's focused on that. That's what he's talking about. There was a time in one of the assemblies I used to attend, I always used to ask two questions when I saw people. What are you reading? And whose life are you working? Whose life are you building into? Well, you know, people started to avoid me. <laughs> there was a circular thing, and Deb knows because she was there. I would come and I'd see the person and I'd start walking towards them and they'd all of a sudden have to turn a different direction. It was amazing. It was a miracle. It's just like I had this repellent. <laughs> because I was going to ask them, what are you reading? And whose life are you building into? Because a lot of times they would say, uh, nothing and nobody. And then I go, oh, okay, I'm confused. So I realized that I probably should stop asking that question. And one of the elders at the assembly said, when we sent you away, Al, as a missionary, we sent you 10,000 miles away. If we had sent you any further, you'd start to come back. Sorry. So we're going to send you equi halfway around the world because then you, it's a long way for you to start coming back. And he jokes about that to this day. Um, I think he's half serious, actually. <laughs> but it was good. Became a very good friend. So, that illustration, right, just think about this. You know, when someone puts a presentation up like this, you know, the, the thing is, it's not the job of the preacher or the one who's teaching to beat people up. That's not the job. That's not my job. But if the Holy Spirit is whispering in your ear, you know, um, you might want to get to know me a little more. If he's doing that today, listen. And then say, I think, I think I'm going to do that. There's so many devotionals you can get today. There's so much you can get. You'd, there's no excuses, right? And I, I did this last time as well. I'll do it again. What a wonderful treasure. The gift of God without measure. We'll travel together, my Bible and I. I heard a Welsh evangelist teach that. And the Irish evangelist said this to me. Okay. He said, Al. He said, you know what you're like? And I said, no. It's a good thing Sandra's not here. He said, I know what you're like. He says, what God wants you to be? I was like a tool in a toolbox. I said, oh, tell me more. He said, yes. And he wants you to stay sharp. He wants you to grow in Christ. Because when he reaches down to get a tool, he doesn't want a blunt instrument. He wants something sharp. <laughs> We don't know when God's going to use us. We don't know how he's going to use us. I went to my pharmacist the other day, got some kind of vaccine, and it just happens to be a Pakistani. We speak Urdu together. But our friendship is growing. So while I'm in his office, he opens up to me about his stress level and how hard it is to maintain what he's doing. And I'm looking and I'm going, oh, I'm just not a patient. I'm becoming your friend. And he just shared his heart. So I said to him, I said, so-and-so, when your parents come back from Pakistan, would you come to our place for a meal? Of course, he said. Perfect. And he tells everybody who can speak or do as well, he says, this guy came to the Walmart parking lot and talked to my parents, and they were shocked. And he tells everybody, so he was telling that story again yesterday to a new guy who speaks Urdu, and I thought, okay, that's good. He's becoming a friend. So think about your life. There are people who are friends. I have a very good friend of mine. We traveled to Europe together. And then I came to Christ, and we kind of separated. 
we went different paths. But what happened was God brought us back together. We now meet once a month. We go to the Pinocchio Boston Pizza. <laughs> yeah. Yay! They're getting to know us. We get all the high spots. And as we're there, we talk and we share, and it's really normally three to four hours. But this last time, because I've been praying for him, this last time I said, so-and-so, I have a gift for you. And it's the Gospel of John. And he said, I accept your gift. That's a nice gift. I will keep this in my backpack. What that means is, he's probably going to start reading it. So I pray for his soul. And I think of you. Who are you? Whose friends are you? Who are your friends? Who are you connected with? Who, who could you be connected with? What I used to do, and I do it periodically, I still do it now, I guess. When we were trying to navigate to the university, I would come and people could tell stories. And Deb was there, and um, she heard these stories, and she thought, these can't be true. But I would pray every day for God to give me someone to share the gospel with. So one day, one day I'm going to the university, and there, outside, on his motorcycle with chains hanging all over him and tattoos everywhere, right? Stereotypical. There was a guy and I thought, okay, here you go, Al. So I said, hi, my name's Al. My name's Moses. <laughs> Tell me, what do you know about Moses? And he said something that I can't repeat publicly. <laughs> But we ended up talking anyway. And you know what he, he said? Yeah, might be something to consider. And I went, good, I'll pray for you, Moses. Opportunities like that. Why? We get the heart of Jesus. And what's the heart of Jesus? Well, he said, I have other villages to go to. I have other people to go to. I have other ones. I've got to share the gospel. I've got to go. I have to keep going. We're not all evangelist people. I get it. I understand that. But we all have hope within us. Amen? And that hope can be shared with somebody who doesn't have it when they talk with you. And we pray for those opportunities. So, chapter 2. <laughs> Here we go. I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you and for those at Laodicea, for all who have not met me personally. You know that Paul wrote this from a Roman jail? Do you think a Roman jail was a nice place to be in? No, he was suffering, but he counted his suffering all joy, right? But he wrote this from a Roman jail. And he said, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. Can that be the same thing for us? Can you be encouraged in heart today? Can you be united in love? Now, one of the things that Balmoral does really, really great, and I've seen this now for two years. So we put on Alpha, and there are so many volunteers of various stages at various levels that it just works. It just works, and people are willing to do it. People go to the mustard seat. People do the bread ministry. People do all kinds of things here. People are visiting people. Good grief, Bob's organizing the care group. And what are people doing? Going to see people who need a little care and love. So it's so good to see those things that happen right here at Balmoral. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding fine arguments. Because in Colossae, there were fine-sounding arguments, and people were being led astray by these arguments. And Paul said, don't let anyone lead you astray. So, some quick verses here. When Jesus left, right, and he went to heaven, he said, I sent the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit lives within us. Let's get that straight. Jesus is where? The Bible says Jesus is at the right hand of God. Now God is a spirit, so I'm not sure what that means, because he's a spirit, so what does it mean to be the right hand? Well, it means metaphorically he's right there, and he intercedes for us on a regular basis. But who is on earth? 
the Holy Spirit. Who lives within our heart? The Holy Spirit. Who teaches us all things? The Holy Spirit. And he says this, Jesus says this, and this is in John. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. What's the Holy Spirit's job? To remind you everything that Jesus said. So the Holy Spirit will do that today as well. He'll remind you of the things that Jesus said. He'll remind you of the things that Jesus wants you to do. And then Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. And then he says, when the advocate, helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, will testify about me. And then John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Did you put the last one up, Gail? Last one, that's a hint. It's about this preacher says as I continue to close. Can you see that? This is from John Stott. What does it mean to be mature in Christ? So John says this. I can't read the little screen at the back. So, dear sisters and brothers, if only the veil could be taken from our eyes, if only we could see Jesus as he is in his full authenticity, in the fullness of his divine human person and of his saving work, why then surely we would see how worthy he is of our faith and love and obedience and worship, and we would grow into maturity into... Christ. What is maturity into Christ? This is it, folks. And it's no secret. It takes a little bit of time. But here's the interesting thing. What he wants you to do is not add things that you must do and must not do. Because if you do that, then he puts on the same thing the Pharisees put on the Jewish people. You must do this, you must do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you must do that, you must... Well, that's a scary place to be. The reason I didn't want to become a Christian when I was growing up playing hockey, I don't want to become a Christian because they were weird. And it seems like they had all these stupid rules. I didn't want any part of it. And then... I realized when I came to know Jesus as my Savior, it wasn't about rules. It was about a relationship. Rules without a relationship creates rebellion. You can't tell me what to do. Word of God, it doesn't say that. You can't tell me what to do. But what he wants us to become is pliable. Grow into this maturity. And, and just read it again to yourself. And it's like, don't beat yourself up. And don't say, well, I must do this, and I'm going to read the Bible ten times more than I ever did, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Do you know what will happen? Fifteen minutes after you walk through this door, you'll forget all about that. And then you'll beat yourself up. You'll hurt yourself. It's amazing what we do. Like, you know the saying, my feet are killing me? Could you picture that? It's a good thing some of these things don't, aren't true. But what you do want to walk out of here with is this. This means if I pay attention to the whisperings of the Holy Spirit through the intake of the Word of God, through the method of meditation and application, I could mature in Christ the answer is yes. You will start to have the heart for the things that his heart breaks for. You will start to want to do those things that he wants to do. You might stop being rude to your neighbors. You might stop being mean to your wife. You might stop being whatever. Because you'll have the heart and the action of Jesus Christ living in you. Can I get an amen? amen. Can we walk out with that? Can we not beat ourselves up? But can we ask the Holy Spirit, please, 
fill me with your love. Fill me with a vision. What a beautiful song, Robin and Ellen. Be the, how old is that song? Like it's an old Irish song, I believe, right? Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. When I studied and did my graduate work, they, I never knew this before, but they talked about the lenses that we look through. Everything we do, we look through a lens. What if the lens we look through was filled with the love of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit? Wouldn't we be different? Would the world be different? Absolutely. And thank God it happens. When there's earthquakes, when there's floods, when there's all these things that happen, who are usually the first people there? Christian people. Because they're the hands and feet of God, and away they go. Hands and feet of Christ. And away they go, and they go to serve. And he gives us that opportunity today. So I am saying to you, be encouraged as you walk out here today. Continue to love and serve, but do it in the power of the Spirit. And don't do it out of guilt, because that'll just make you feel terrible. And you'll blame me. But this is recorded, this message. So I never did say to blame yourself. I said to actually look to Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit fill you with power and his love. Isn't that great? So next week, John's coming. John Cross, not John the, the Apostle. And he's going to share further on about um, Jesus. Beautiful verses. Colossians is a powerful, powerful book. So thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Let me close in prayer. Father in heaven, first of all, thank you that we can say Father in heaven. For we know around the world that is not possible for many, many people. They don't know you as your father, but we know you as a father. And for that, we thank you. We bless you. May you encourage our heart. May you lift our heart. May you challenge us. May you draw us nearer to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we give you thanks in his precious name. Amen. And the benediction is this. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. There it is again hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations might believe and obey him. To the one, to the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.